This is the Cloud Ace Podcast, bringing you the latest in cloud security through captivating chats with fascinating cybersecurity experts who are leaving their mark on the industry. Cloud Ace is brought to you by the SANS Institute and hosted by SANS Certified Instructor Brandon Evans. And now, prepare for departure. We are cleared for takeoff. Here's your captain, Brandon Evans. All right, so today I have the honor of talking to Dr. Anton Shavukin, a senior security leader at Google Cloud. Previously, Anton was the head of solution strategy for Chronicle Security, a cloud native SIM solution that was acquired by Google Cloud and integrated into the platform in 2019. He has served in many other high level roles and organizations throughout his career, including as a research vice president and distinguished architect, or sorry, distinguished analyst for Gartner. We are so thankful that Anton has taken the time to share his immense experience with the SANS community on multiple occasions, and I'm thrilled to learn and listen with him. Without further ado, welcome, Anton. Hey, thank you for having me. It'll be fun. Awesome. So you've played a big part in shaping the cloud, but like many of the listeners on this podcast, you've been doing security long before the cloud has existed. Can you share your journey of breaking into the cloud, how you were first introduced to it, and how it was different to you from on-premises? Uh, admittedly, I probably spent uh, more of my energy, my my time, my kind of heart and soul shaping the security operations and SIM and a few other types of things. So I, admittedly, cloud is, is a more recent endeavor for me. But uh, it's interesting that uh, during my tenure at Gartner, I've dealt with many clients who are calling Gartner, who were calling Gartner with questions about cloud. Again, uh, not to reveal too many details, but many of them were traditional on-premise companies who sort of just encountered cloud. Some of them sounded like they encountered cloud in some kind of a dark alley somewhere on the side uh, because they were kind of scared. And so the I started to learn what cloud is from the perspective of a non-cloud native. In parallel, I was talking to some other clients, organizations, people in the industry about how they are approaching cloud. And initially, I was pretty pretty confused, frankly, because when you talk as an analyst, when you talk at 9 a.m., you talk to a complete cloud native who never lived anywhere but the cloud, who whose company was started on Kubernetes and whose company was started on all the cloud native methodologies and for whom DevOps and SRE methodologies are very much like the only reality they know. And then at 10 a.m., you talk to somebody who is from a band that maybe was founded in like 1875. And so their IT maybe dates to like 1960s, perhaps, if not 1950s. So their IT represented the layers of technology from the day of IT coming into the banking business again, decades ago. And then cloud is just one layer on top. So imagine how different life is at a company that, actually was born in the cloud and the company uh, that was born in maybe before mainframe era or something. So this really made me the most, maybe stress, frankly, because it was very clear to me that cloud approaches and cloud security advice in particular looks dramatically different. Uh, Gartner at the time, mostly focused on more traditional companies. I'm pretty sure it's the case now. And so I had more of the second type, but it was immensely fun to learn from the first type as well. So to me, cloud came as kind of this kind of elephant. You touch it from one side, it's all Kubernetes and it's all modern and it's all super scalable and effective. And you touch it from another side and it's just one thing that annoys IT people because they're used to having servers in the data center. Certainly. And I have seen that firsthand. Uh, you have these companies that have been around for a long time and you have to build on top of that legacy code. Yep. You really don't have a whole lot of choice because that code has been making the organization business for 20 years. So you'll find crazy things where people are writing these Kubernetes applications that then call shell scripts that invoke these really yes. old applications that have not been touched in 20 years. Right. And 20, I think, is kind of good news. Because, you know, remember, this is 2022. So 20 years ago is 2002. It's kind of still a modern era. So, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I suspect some of the stuff I've seen touches the code written maybe 60 years ago, or maybe 50 years ago. Not 60, probably, but maybe like 40 years ago. And I don't know. I have no idea how you integrate COBOL with, like, Kubernetes. But people do. 
And they really do. And imagine the security back to our beloved domain, right? How to even think about security if up front you have something very modern and the backside of the animal is something that's 50 years old. So security thinking, even thinking, forget doing for now, even security thinking is just doesn't come naturally. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to put ideas on it? Well, somewhere you may have ideas uh, or somewhere you may have something else. Like the point is that it's really tricky. Absolutely. I can imagine several types of vulnerabilities that would come out of that inherently, such as injection Mm -hmm. vulnerabilities, where you take the data from one level and then pass it to this backside of the animal, like you mentioned. Or if you're trying to rewrite an application, like if I was tasked with rewriting an application from Fortran to Node.js, I'm pretty (laughs) sure I would introduce (laughs) some business logic issues, authorization issues, all sorts of issues, because I would have no idea how to read that old code. So I had the opportunity to listen to the previous podcast you were on. You were on uh, Sans's Cyber Defense podcast, which is Blueprint hosted by John Hubbard. And Mm -hmm. I found it really informative, despite not being a blue teamer by trade. And I hope the audience will check that out. I don't want to rehash that conversation Mm -hmm. because it's uh, valuable by itself. But my favorite part of that episode is related to what you just mentioned, where you were talking to a security leader who wanted to do all these Mm -hmm. traditional types of blue team defenses in the cloud. And you wanted Mm -hmm. to shake him uh, and say, hey, this is the cloud. But you mentioned, and you were enlightened, you said, like the Buddha, you mentioned that they were following on-prem's blueprint because that's the only blueprint that they know. So is that a unique problem for SOC leaders and SOC analysts? Or do you find that that same mentality occurs in other domains of security in the cloud? So uh, let me uh, step one step back to not repeat that example. And you're right. That example really struck me quite hard. And I was kind of, I I stopped any and all kind of a cloud native shaming or cloud I'm not a cloud native as such, like a cloud uh, cl- cloud tourist, kind of a cloud immigrant. Maybe I'm not a cloud tourist at this point. I'm a kind of, I live in the cloud, but maybe I'm not a cloud native. Uh, and I really kind of cut it out and said, okay, these guys, they we need to do better with them because just telling them you're wrong, do this, is never going to work. So the the where I would go to the side from your question is this. So on our own podcast, and I, I swear this is not about promoting the podcast. It's about an episode we recorded literally yesterday with somebody who actually lived through a virtualization revolution 20 years ago, uh, to, well, maybe 15 years ago. And he said, remember how VMware and other tech came in the mid-2000s? It was really cool. And it really confused a lot of people because they did think in terms of hardware. They did think in terms of where is the server located? And uh, it's interesting how some of the lessons and some of the processing that happened to build new new processes, to build new activities for IT, really had to be revolutionized the first time for virtualization. And now some companies are kind of have to go through another revolution where it's not about virtualization anymore. This is 15, 20 years ago, but it's about native cloud applications, other stuff that's under third-party control. So to me, the interesting bit is that it's interesting that we have examples from the past where people had to go through a pretty dramatic, even though I think cloud is a bigger change than virtualization was because of third-party control. Uh, And that to me is interesting how some companies slept through the previous one and they didn't really extract any lessons from it. And now they're like, oh my God, what do you mean I don't have any servers? And my question was, where were you 20 years ago when when virtualization came? Uh, That question was really useful to ask in 2008. But so my less rambling point from from that argument is that there are definitely things happening with the how thinking has to change. And it's not only in the SOC and it's not only uh, in other areas of cyber, but moreover, cloud isn't even the first time it kind of has to happen. Absolutely. And I have to imagine the organizations that are pushing for cloud transformation that were sleeping during that era I'm imagining a lot of that has to do with the hype, the idea that all of our problems will be solved if we move to the cloud. And yeah, I'd be really, really worried to see an organization that slept through the virtualization era 
try to go cloud, try to adopt Kubernetes serverless and all these other new technologies. Yes. I, I'd be really worried because that was a, a chance to learn at least some of the lessons. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, the example that came up on the same episode is, of course, compliance. My old love, and, not, and it's not in the sense that it's my ex or anything, but my old love was PCI compliance, right? And I, I defended PCI from many people who said PCI harmed security because in my mind, PCI helped security. The reason I'm bringing up PCI is that PCI had to be kind of not torn apart, but kind of reformed around virtualization. There was a really good document written by a PCI council, probably in 2008, about how to apply PCI in virtual environments. But I see some QSAs and some other auditors today really get confused about the cloud over some of the same stuff that PCI Council wrote in 2008, which, you know, you probably don't go to, to PCI Council for IT innovation. You really don't. But, <laughs> but the point is that some of the lessons companies need to learn, even some regulators learned uh, 10 plus years ago. So it's, it's interesting to observe that. And I think that to me, the main kind of vehicle or a tool I'm trying to use to make it better, again, my area being cloud security, not cloud in general, is to kind of see how we can build a sort of a tool to remap mental models from people who are thinking in data centers and servers and other stuff. So it's not about tell them what to do. It's not about explain cloud. It's not about tell them, tell them to the classes. All of these are kind of useful, but ultimately, if their mental models are on premise, where is this data located? And I'm like, okay, so you need to learn about data discovery in the cloud, perhaps. Like, they are not asking about where the where is the data on what server very clearly, but it's clear that this question needs to be mapped to its cloud equivalent. Absolutely. People think that, oh, you know, let's just put a firewall around this. We're good. Yes. They don't fully understand that there's these managed services that can expose your data and oftentimes do expose your data to catastrophic consequences. Now, I wasn't around really for the virtualization uh, transformation. I remember a world before virtualization and then all of a sudden VPSs were a thing. But I imagine that at the time, there was some concern that, oh, this was just hype. This was, you know, the brand new thing on the block. Maybe this wouldn't survive. Obviously, virtualization persisted. Cloud persisted. Containerization persisted. But I imagine that a lot of organizations are reluctant to make those changes as a result of wondering whether or not things like Kubernetes or serverless are going to exist in the near future. And I worry that that is part of the mm. reason why security seems to be behind development five years, where they're just not learning these technologies because they think that they're going to blow over. Have you seen mm. that in your experience? Not as such, perhaps about specific tech, but I think that, I think there are maybe like, I don't know, pick some way to manage containers and people have doubts about that. But I, I still feel like uh, it goes a little bit outside of my real expertise being security, but I do, I do think that there are kind of broader trends that are moderately unambiguous and, and moderately easy to predict slash extrapolate, not predict, more extrapolate. So for example, if you have, if a typical company, and again, these are um, numbers I'm making up. So if a typical company has 30% servers, uh, 60% uh, virtual machines and 10%, I don't know, containers and microservices, modern stuff. And then in three years, they have 5% servers, 30% virtual machines, and the rest is more modern stack. It's kind of, the trend is pretty clear. Again, I use two data points, but there are really more data points. So some of the stuff is probably easy to extrapolate. Now, a particular brand of a tech may disappear. I, I don't know. But I feel like the direction away from physical server to virtual machine to container, to other type of stack is reasonably uncontested as, 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 as a, the main flow of the IT river, so to say. That's my impression. I don't, think, I don't think people say, oh, containers, that's a fad. We're going to go back to virtual machines in five years. Like, I've never heard that. Yeah, I, I think that that was kind of the impression that I got when it was starting to blow up in about 2015. And now... I think that the, the next paradigm shift is 
like serverless. And but I it's a hype that- cycle. Wait, wait, wait. I think there is a much easier explanation. It's mm-hmm. uh, again, to use the tool, the one of the most famous tools from Gartner is the hype cycle, right? You In 2015, you looked at the peak and stuff started to fall, drop off the peak, right? So uh, the there was an impression of this tech being used less, talked about less, but ultimately that's the hype cycle curve. Stuff goes up, stuff goes to a huge peak, everybody's excited, then stuff goes down, goes into the ditch, and then climbs out of a ditch and becomes normal. So to me, what you're describing is like a normal hype cycle behavior, which is characteristic of all, pretty much all tech, at least to the best of my knowledge. Absolutely. Yes. I, I have no doubt that we're moving towards less servers, certainly less on-prem. I just remember finding it so funny when I mm-hmm. attended LinuxCon in 2015, and it was mm-hmm. really my first time being exposed to container technologies. We had some people that were saying, hey, this is the best thing since sliced bread regarding security. Hey, we can run things more efficiently, but also have isolation. We don't mm-hmm. have to mm-hmm. worry too much about these breakout vulnerabilities, but also we get all the performance of not running an entire VM. And I heard that for literally an entire Mm -hmm. day. And then the next (laughs) day was like, containers are terrible. Containers are super insecure. Breakouts happen all the time. So I I know we're definitely heading in that direction. I just see the same thing with serverless where it just popped off. And now Mm -hmm. people seem to be shifting more into the Kubernetes realm of actually running long-lived containers. So I'm wondering what your experience with serverless has been and whether or not you think that that particular paradigm is here to stay. So that one, I haven't really, I'm not that much of an AppSec person. So I do track this to an extent, uh, my kind of cloud security part of the job requires, but uh, the topic of long-lived containers came up again on a recent podcast episode we were recording with somebody. And I sort of thought, wait a second, is this normal? Why are you describing people SSH into containers? Like, that's not how it's supposed to be. Like, even I know that without being, you know, having container depth. But then the, the guest we have, she explained that, well, that's operational reality. That's what people do. And I thought, wait a second. I think they're just copying their on-premise thinking. So to me, the point you mentioned about, like, say, long-lived containers or other cloud-native tech being used in, in that manner to me, these are kind of vestiges of the of the of the previous era of thinking, and and they're here not because people are bad, but because larger masses of people are arriving at the cloud gate, and a lot of them arrive with their baggage, and their baggage is how they used to do it. So their baggage is we SSH into servers, we SSH into VMs, so we have containers, we're going to SSH. It's like whoa, wait a second, wait, 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 you missed one point about them being ephemeral. And there's this other stuff that's the whole kind of mythology slash practices that come with it. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, where is the stage? <laughs> so, so to me, this is a little bit, uh, uh, our guest sh- shared some really scary stats. Like, uh, I'm going to look it up as, as we are talking because the idea was that uh, a lot of stuff that we expected containers to kill, uh, just like operationally, it should be, infrequent or infeasible is really kind of common. Uh, like containers running with high and critical volumes, shell usage is containers. And again, the quote uh, when, when, when that guest said, our report shows that 64, 62% of containers, this is by the way, a SysDig report, if, if somebody needs to look it up, uh, we, they detect shells in containers. And I'm like, say what? 62% of containers have people uh, using a shell, this is like 62% of zoos have a dragon in them. This shouldn't exist. This is not how it's supposed to work. But again, I'm not going to argue with facts. If that if people do that, then people do that. Yes, and I think that it's all going back to that blueprint. This is the only blueprint yes. that they know in security. It's also the only blueprint that they understand in operations. Yes. They're already being expected to learn all of these new technologies. Now you're telling them you have to learn these new technologies and learn the new philosophies behind them. That's, yes. that's quite a big ask for a lot of these organizations. Yes. And then at the same time, I think there's a lot of security concerns with making some of these changes. So I'm completely with you. I hate SSH on any compute. I do not want people to manually 
modify in any way these virtual machines. That results in having snowflake virtual machines or snowflake containers where you have one server that's configured one way, other servers that are configured another way. They have radically different security controls. I'm totally with you. But on the flip side, a lot of people are scared of ephemeral infrastructure, are scared of infrastructure as code, because now you're basically giving development the ability to shape production. They can't modify it manually, but they can shape production in very, very powerful ways, like spinning up entire VMs without necessarily working with a traditional operations team. So how where does DevOps play in this space? Uh, is, is DevOps a net good for security? I certainly think so, but there's also drawbacks. What do you think? So lately, I've been trying to learn a lot from how, for example, Google does the practice. Again, I'm not the right person to ask about the difference between the DevOps as a practice or as an art and, say, site liability engineering, SRE as a practice and art. Like, clearly, they're from the related field. I mean, that's, that part is like a no-brainer. But I'm try- I've been trying to learn a lot of the lessons that these people learned when they revolutionized IT operations. Because to me, DevOps and SRE are phenomenon that kind of changed how IT is done. And IT is done under these philosophies, IT is clearly done measurably better, whatever better is. So the the challenge is, there are two challenges. Is security done better alongside, that's A. And B is security, frankly, hasn't been revolutionized. So if you have IT that's run on different principles and security that's run on the principles from the previous generation, we have a problem. So it's both attaching security to these, to these methodologies and approaches and also using their lessons to improve security has been kind of my recent obsession. So I am not the right guest to ask about is DevOps better for security? Again, I'm not an AppSec person. I don't have the depth in judging this, but I do see some signals and I do see some ways of where people did it wrong. And the umbrella area where people did it wrong is where IT transformed alongside those principles and security did not. This is how you get daily code changes and quarterly code reviews by security. Like this doesn't compile. It shouldn't compile. If you have a PCI compliance requirement six, whatever says you must review code for security. Uh, And then somebody would come every quarter and review the code. But wait a second, you change the code every day. What? Oh, no, that that can't both be true. Either you change code every day or you're secure because you have quarterly code reviews. No, you have something would break and you have to harmonize the two. Either you go back to the previous IT approaches, which people would not do, obviously, or you get security to transform along the same models. And people have definitely done it. And the question is the percentages. I don't know the percentages. Is are 10% of people who have adopted DevOps also modernized security or is it 90%? I'm pretty sure it's not 90%. I, I I've definitely. seen things as as I sometimes people sometimes uh, as a former analyst I like to say I've seen I've seen things you won't believe, but sometimes I've seen really good things you won't believe, like people patching 10,000 machines in like a day because their practices and processes are very modern. So sometimes when IT modernizes and security modernizes with it, a lot of magic becomes possible. It is a hard journey and it's kind of a hard two journeys, right? It's a journey for IT and then it's a journey for security. I'm kind of rambling a bit, but you also, it's pretty clear that I've put up a disclaimer that I'm not the best AppSec person or Dev, DevOps plus security person. Hi, this is Sean McCullough. The journey into securely operating cloud infrastructure requires new tools and new approaches for better visibility into the cloud environment and threat landscape. This includes the ability to capture appropriate data and, most importantly, to be able to analyze and correlate the data effectively and accurately to understand if specific threats are legitimately based for your environment. SEC 541, the Cloud Security Attacker Techniques, Monitoring and Threat Detection class starts each section by walking through a real-world attack campaign against a real cloud infrastructure and breaking down how it happened, what made it successful, and what really could have been done to catch the attackers in the act. 
After dissecting these attacks, students learn how to leverage cloud-native and cloud-integrated capabilities to detect and investigate similar attacks in a real environment, as well as leverage an arsenal of analytics, detections, and best practices. The course dives into analysis, logs, and behaviors that you can use to find malicious activity in your cloud architecture. To learn more, check out sans.org slash SEC 541. You'd fool me. I think that you've uh, provided a very good uh, summary of the industry and the trends. You say 90%. Um, you wouldn't think it's 90%. I'd be surprised to learn that it's over 50% just because Fair. security lags behind development, as we mentioned. And I think something that, something that lags behind security is also compliance, right? Mm-hmm. You mentioned mm-hmm. about PCI. Oh God, yes. You mentioned uh, there's a lot of other regulatory uh, regimes out there. Mm-hmm. How much of a barrier do you think compliance is to modernization, right? I know a lot of security people will follow certain policies because a compliance regime requires it. And like you said, there's no harmony there. Do you think that compliance overall has to be reshapen for that purpose? So this is uh, a tricky question because I think that, I don't know, I don't want to make um, our legal team mad when I would say something bad about compliance, but uh, lately we've been investigating a lot of compliance as code approaches and kind of trying to figure out how to approach, how to, well, we have infrastructure as code, people coined the buzzword for security as code, which nobody really knows what it is. Occasionally, I use detection as code for something more particular. But the point is that compliance as code is actually more logical because if you have infrastructure as code, then rules that limit your infrastructure for compliance reasons are probably code as well, or at least it's not crazy to expect that a lot of them would become uh, declarative statements in some file, right? So I think that compliance has been challenging for this modern IT environments. But I also have seen some success stories where compliance was made to work in those modern environments. And typically the way they treated it was some something that fits under the compliance as code umbrella. And of course, compliance would have things that aren't inside information systems that are about, I don't know, you need to have background checks for employees. And of course, these aren't as code. They're still in the, in the mid space, in the human space. That I'm not talking about that, but compliance that att- attaches the systems probably, probably and eventually would become a form of a, a, a code or configuration file or, or I don't know, to, not to date me to say script, but ultimately it would become code. And, and that's when it would, it would be able to run at the same speed as IT development and operations. Do I think it's doable? Yes. Do I think it's easy to do? It will happen soon? No. So yes, compliance regimes uh, definitely are challenging to deal with within uh, the cloud space. And uh, configuration definitely makes a lot of sense to me. I think it makes a lot of sense to a lot of people how you want to codify those settings. But then we can talk a little bit about the shared responsibility model where, you know, hey, you're able to be compliant. You're able to make sure that you're checking all those boxes and also materially improving security. But now you have to worry about this other entities caring about security. Uh, You want to delve into a little bit how customers can reliably use these cloud providers and know that they are being covered and that they're not violating these various regimes? So uh, funny enough, uh, just yesterday night, I was trying to finish a blog post about shared shared responsibility model and where it breaks. And there are some examples co- that are compliance related. So uh, to put my I mean, vendor hat briefly on is uh, at Google, we're trying to build a model that's sort of a an evolution of shared responsibility where essentially we call it shared fate, but at this point it's kind of a, a bit of a, like our marketing term, I guess, which indicates that it's a shared responsibility where a provider actually is more actively involved in helping clients. That's kind of a more, more tame view. Uh, I'll send you a link with a more formal definition. But the idea is that to me, the it's almost impossible to simply write a, a document that says, cloud provider does this, customer does the rest. And call it a day. Like that is not really working. It's not working with security. It's not working with compliance. Because in theory, you should be able to do it. And of course, every compliance mandate, PCI, uh, PCI DSS has 
a shared dispensability matrix, how a PCI would look in the cloud. Sure, that exists, but a lot of nuance and a lot of specific implementation details, how it fares in the real world are really tricky. And so, and some of them are tricky in a kind of unsolvable, unfixable way tricky under a current model. I, I, in, in the blog, I'm going to mention something like, here is the big, complex technical task that you, the cloud user, should do. And if you do it wrong, you're going to be in so much security trouble. Like, that's a little unfair to say if you're a cloud provider, because ultimately cloud providers know cloud better. They're probably better resource security-wide. And simply saying, hey, cloud user, here's the big task. You do it. And if you don't do it well, you're so screwed. Like, that's not great, right? Like, everybody is getting it. Like, this is a bad idea. But the, the naive approach to shared responsibility model is exactly that. People say, my side, your side. But uh, to me, this needs to evolve. And uh, some of my work is kind of trying to figure out how to evolve it in, su- in such a way that clients aren't left with some of the things they are not able to handle, either practically or even, even just mentally. There, there is, the tasks are beyond that. That's a really good point and something I really wanted to talk to you about, which is defaults, right? Uh-huh. Security defaults within these cloud providers. Yeah, you're, you're, quoting, you're quoting from my blog draft, by the way. It's really uncanny because it, it has a little mini section about <laughs> how defaults are screwing the shared dispensability model. So this is like interesting. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. For well, that. No, that's awesome. I'm glad to see that I'm on the same wavelength as you and that I'm thinking about the right things. But yeah, we talk a lot in the course that I've written for SANS, SEC 510, about Mm -hmm. all of these defaults and how the cloud provider, like we said, you know, you're responsible for this, you're responsible for that. But the cloud provider literally is recommending to the customer to do things that are not only bad, but in some cases they know are bad. So for example, I've seen Mm -hmm. in a variety of different cloud consoles, when you spin up a new virtual machine, it will start off by giving you open ports, uh, SSH or RDP to the world. And then in the bottom of the page, it'll say, hey, this setting that we just populated for you, don't do that. It's really, really, really bad. Why would you ever think to use this setting? And it's yeah. like, you populated the setting. So Is the customer really responsible for educating themselves about these secure or insecure defaults? Or is it on the provider to really harden those settings? I mean, to me, the insecure defaults uh, is kind of an interesting one because uh, I think here we have kind of a battle against insecure defaults. But ultimately, the problem with defaults goes even further, namely that okay, I have a secure default, but I can't explain to a customer how they would determine their risk profile and what is the risk profile and any of that other stuff. So the point is that if I give you a secure default and say, this is secure, but you're on your own, things are better. But if they lack understanding about the implications, they can turn it off. You know, think about all the S3 buckets, right? All the, I mean, S3 buckets, Last time I checked, you know, uh, our, you know, the other guy from Seattle, Cloud, right? Uh, they're closed by default. N- nobody is really starting the storage buckets in public. But there are so many problems from public storage buckets, right? So sometimes even a secure default wouldn't cut it. Like with defaults, it's almost like you, you the provider, are responsible for, for the default setting, for sure. Uh, but then you are also kind of responsible for guiding the client to not shooting themselves in the foot. At least in my mind, it shouldn't just be figure out your risk, buddy, and then do the right setting. See you later. Bye. Thanks. Like this is also not great. So to me, insecure default or secure default, that's better, but neither still cuts far enough with some of the things. Uh, how about this? I give you a big complicated system like Kubernetes, and I set some defaults and I say, these are secure. You try something and something doesn't work. You think, oh, it must be security. I'll turn it off. How are you better off? You're really not better off. Like The only advantage, by the way, is that clearly you did it to yourself. Okay, fine. But 
what if I, the provider, had a chance to guide you, educate you, help you, and I didn't take the shot? To me, it's a little bit on the provider as well. So we are trying to change that because to me, this is kind of a big, hairy problem in cloud security. Yes, uh, there's really an important balance you have to uh, make because the cloud providers would become less popular if they really lock things down by default. Imagine, Too much. Yeah. Yeah, imagine how difficult it would be for someone on-premises to lift and shift their virtual machine from on-prem to the cloud if they didn't have that default port open. They wouldn't even know how to access this. And one of the analogies that I like to make is to Microsoft Windows and how Windows went through so many years of being catastrophically insecure. They finally Mm -hmm. started taking things seriously, arguably, and uh, they released a version of Windows that was leaps and bounds more secure than the previous versions. And that was Vista. And Vista broke everything. And that's because a lot of people were depending on those insecure defaults or uh, doing things that are just not secure at all on purpose. And now if you turn those things off, like you said, people are just going to say, oh, okay, let's revert that setting. And all that really does for the cloud provider is reduce liability. Correct. And ultimately, I want to not just reduce liability. I want to improve security for clients. Like I want the correct perception that cloud is built much more securely to be there. Like again, to quote my uh, former Gartner colleagues, uh, after this whole hoopla about is cloud secure kind of settled and people said, yeah, cloud is secure. So this matter is, is closed, but are you using it securely? And the answer for many people is frankly, no. So, so if somebody wakes me up at 3 a.m. and says, Anton, is cloud secure? I'm going to quote my, uh, my, uh, my, my CISA here, Phil Venables, and I say, Yes, cloud is probably much more secure than, than the most, if not all, on-premise environments. However, are clients, are all clients using it securely? Uh, the answer is, well, that's a lot more debatable. So to me, the, the way to use cloud insecurity, the opportunity to use cloud insecurity is there. Uh, we may have default encryption. We may have great key management. We may have perimeter controls. We may have a bunch of other things. But can you do things uh, similar to what you did them on prem, done on prem, and kind of open the settings, do other things, make mistakes, sure. And then, to me, providers, well, us at least, maybe not other providers, we will be working on making this journey go deeper on the client side. So, to me, the shared fate is kind of helping clients navigate this and helping clients deal with that, rather than just saying, "Sorry, buddy, it's on your side." Bye. To me, that doesn't cut it. Absolutely. And for those who are listening, uh, you mentioned a lot of great resources, a lot of great blog posts. We'll make sure to include those in the show notes for those who would like to access them after listening to the session. So I appreciate all of those great resources and additional learning. Absolutely. Now, I know you're not here to market Google Cloud. I know that that's not your role here. You want to talk about cloud more holistically. And I do appreciate that. But you can you go into a little bit more detail about how you are guiding those clients? Like, what does that process actually look like? Are we mostly talking documentation or their professional services that are provided? And where can customers get those professional services? So this to me is kind of a bigger question. And I I am not entirely sure I'm like the best person to answer it. And here's why. Um, Google Cloud, Google is big and Google Cloud is also quite big. And there are many different teams. I work for Office of the CISO now. So Office of the CISO does... Uh, provide strategic advisory to clients, but there are many other teams, professional services, the solution teams. So it's kind of, there are many routes to get help from very low touch, like go read the docs, to very high touch, have Anton fly around to your location and help you with security, uh, cloud security in your SOC. So the, the range is kind of a big range from have Anton show up tomorrow morning to help you with cover, cloud coverage in your stock to go read the docs. <laughs> and, and we do offer things. And uh, I'm not trying to say, go and request that I fly out, fly out and help your stock. <laughs> the point is that there's a range of services from read the docs to many, many other type of approaches from very low touch to very, very high touch. Well, 
I know you're not trying to advertise that, but I have a feeling you're going to be maxing out all of your uh, travel points uh, as a result of mentioning that that is a service that you do offer, that Google does yeah. offer. I didn't say it's common, or, or, or <laughs> but, but I, I did do that. Even during the COVID times, it was more virtual. But for example, we did a SOC transformation workshops kind of focused on uh, using the same approaches that changed IT to change security operations. To me, this was kind of a, a very tricky project, especially for large organizations where they their IT is kind of running away quickly, but their security is figuring out like how to not stay far behind. And you're right, the, the, the real caboose and the real train is like IT runs, security runs behind it sometimes, and then compliance runs far behind. And, uh, uh, you know, to remember the PCI, the PCI days, I, I thought the question, is virtual machine separation good enough for PCI compliance? It was like a really hot question of 2008. But like, I heard somebody mention it like two weeks ago and I'm like, whoa, wait a second. I thought that's settled. Even PCI console gives you guidance in a very famous 2009 <laughs> document on that matter. So like, why are you still puzzled by that? Yeah, that's that's pretty terrifying, honestly. Yeah. And I just imagine that a lot of organizations have that mentality, but at the same time, back where we were talking about the hype, uh, the hype cycle, mm -hmm. a lot of people just have to say, "Oh, we got to go to the cloud. We got to do X, Y, Z things." And I, I hope that people are starting to peel off those old ways of thinking. Now, in your work consulting with Google Cloud customers. How much of an appetite do you think there is to learning these new concepts? Do you think that the average client is really just looking to say, okay, tell me what, which boxes to check, which settings to employ in Google Cloud? I don't want to learn much more. Or do you think people are really trying to actually shift their mindset, generally speaking? Ooh, that is a tough one. I don't think I, I, I may have to hide behind the analyst. It depends question. I'll my, my, my typical, you know, answer at Gartner to not say it depends to people is to say kind of it depends, but let me build a framework for how I would think about the answer. So I'll try to improvise a bit of a framework here. So there's certainly people who are embarking on a full transformation. Uh, they, they are saying, yes, they call us and say, Tell us how Google does it. And it's not an automated sign that they would use the thinking, but at least they want to know how a, a very modern company does it and how modern IP approaches function together, how they integrate with security. So sometimes there's a lot more to it than how Google does it because, frankly, they're not Google. They can't copy what we do, but we're trying to derive lessons from what, what we do, correlate it what happens in the outside world, and provide advice to clients. Now, other people don't come with a question and they come with a question, uh, how do I migrate my data center to the cloud? And that probably means they would have to tread the on-premise blueprint for a while and then slowly veer towards the cloud thinking. So to me, there's no, it's almost like there's no right and wrong here because for some companies, they do say, we are going to transform. Here is a transformation project. It's not 10% plus project. In the security operations domain, we use the term 10x SOC, and people say, sure, 10x is a marketing exaggeration. They're like, no, here are the metrics that literally improve by, well, 10x. In fact, some improve more if you transform your SOC using these principles. And these exist in other domains. But for other companies, they say, we just want to migrate to cloud. And for them, the journey is kind of more incremental. How do I stop doing this on-premise thing that's annoying? It's almost like getting rid of some annoying habits. Do I really need to do full packet capture in the cloud? Uh, well, you, you, you can at the uh, enormous cost, possibly in tools and with limited benefits because some traffic is encrypted, but you can do it. Would you get the benefits? Separate story. But like, Picking things like that to, to then say, uh, okay, but there are much better ways to achieve the same goal. What's the goal? The goal is X. Oh, here's the way to do X. It's a cloud native way to do X. Your on-premise native way gives you half of the results for 10X the cost. 
and your cloud native way would give you the result you want at one fifth the cost. So would you like to change? And they say, some say, no, <laughs> we would stick to our way because we know it. And we say, okay, well, let's talk next time. <laughs> yeah, as I'm, you I'm, mentioned. I'm, it's, I'm, I'm giving a humorous, somewhat connected to facts narrative here, but it's kind of grounded in reality where people, some people do want an incremental journey and you can have an incremental journey. And then as long as you don't get stuck in the on-premise land for forever, because you are not on-premise anymore, you're in the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know that the way you narrated that was quite humorous, but I've seen that exact thing play out so many different times. And you know, you're, you're telling me that story and I'm thinking, wow, that's awesome that they're even trying to perform the same security controls in the cloud. They're trying mm -hmm. to do something like packet capturing, Amazing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the individuals that I've worked with say, oh, we're in the cloud. We don't need to worry about network security. We don't need to worry about monitoring. We're, we're all set. And they don't actually replace it with those various mm -hmm. technologies that you mentioned. So, you know, that humorous scenario, I think, is actually really optimistic. I would love to work with a client like that. <laughs> mm. That's, uh, that's, uh, wow. Wow. And like you said in the Blueprint podcast, and I definitely want people to check that out after this one, uh, there's a lot of inertia, technological inertia. And yeah. I get it, you know, especially people that are in IT that are, or IT security that are close to retirement. Why do you, I want to learn about all these different paradigms when I'm not going to have to use this? What's really the cost benefit analysis there? But I think that you mentioned the exact right approach, right? You cannot go from on-prem to cloud native, all these great services, Kubernetes serverless overnight. It, it is a progressive path. Some people go faster than others, but you can't do it all in one day. You can't build Rome in a day. So I'm absolutely there with you. So I could talk to you forever, Anton, but we are coming up on time. I definitely want to make sure to uh, plug some of the resources uh, that you mentioned and resources that I alluded to. All of the links to the blog posts that were mentioned before will be in the show notes, but definitely check out that Blueprint episode with John Hopper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Anton has a great conversation there about modernizing and migrating the SOC. I'm also really happy to be speaking with you in the SANS Cloud Security Exchange 2022 event. So I hope that folks will check out the recording of those sessions, both Anton's session and the session in which we'll both be on a panel together. I'm really excited for that. And as you mentioned earlier, you have your own podcast, the Google Cloud Security Podcast. Would you like to plug a little bit about what all is discussed in that podcast for the audience? I mean, it's uh, it's a cloud security podcast. We try to discuss pretty much everything cloud security. It is not connected to um, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, or anything else. Uh, it's kind of more of a creative outlet for cloud security. I would say that we have done some really popular episodes that do talk about how Google does something, and sometimes it's not even about cloud. For example, funny enough, our most popular episode in terms of first seven-day listens is the one about how we optimize certain tasks in security operations. How Google does red teaming is an episode which touches in the cloud here and there, but it isn't ultimately about cloud. It's kind of about how a cloud native modern environment like Google runs red teaming. Uh, in other cases, we did do more like normal cloud, like the episode I mentioned with, with a guest from Sysdig was about uh, containers and how people actually use the modern tech stack with legacy practices, for example, that was uh, kind of a mix of topics. Uh, admittedly, some topics skew security operations or data security because these are my pa my uh, maybe bigger passions. But ultimately, we have just general cloud security. We have a cloud compliance episode, funny enough. Actually, I think we have two at this point uh, that are fun enough if you're into that sort of thing. Excellent. And if you're listening to this podcast right now, I'm sure that you'd really love to join for that one as well. So, Anton, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule. I think it is awesome to see your journey. I think it's uh, very helpful for people who are breaking into cloud to see that no one was born doing the cloud, that it's a transformation for everyone, and that cloud security is both 
difficult, interesting, and manageable. So I really appreciate your time and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time. Perfect. Thank you very much for inviting me. That was fun.